Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, I'm Mike Ebby. I'm a managing partner of Must Win, and I'm here to talk to you guys about data center schedulers. So we'll start with what they are and the benefits they provide, uh, both organizationally and operationally, and then we'll dive into how they work, where they leave you hanging, and how to choose the right one for you. Uh, before we get into all that, I want to give you a little introduction to Must Win and why we're qualified to talk about this. <clears throat> So we are a Silicon Valley based software engineering products and DevOps solutions partner. We work on a lot of different technologies and different tech stacks. So we're always on the lookout for new and better tools to make delivering software easier and to make what we deliver better. So we worked at a lot of big tech companies, companies like Deloitte, Google, Apple, Amazon, and more. But I want to focus on one of them in particular that's relevant to this kind of DevOps revolution and was a lot of the inspiration for how Must Win operates itself. We were founded by a bunch of Yammer engineers, so we come from a very cloud-oriented, fast-paced development environment with daily releases, very short product feedback cycles, and all of the DevOps optimizations that make all that possible. So years after Yammer was acquired by Microsoft, people over there are still singing our praises over how big a difference that mindset shift has made when they're delivering their products. Uh, for example, Office products used to be released once every three years, and now Office 365 is adopting a much more streamlined approach based on how Yammer operated. So this is a quote from Christian Buckley, uh, MVP and Chief Marketing Officer. When they, uh, are, are yielding the benefits from all of the uh, SharePoint release improvements. So these days, Mustwin uses that Yammer DNA to bring the, this fast-moving mindset to Fortune 500 companies to either help them adopt it themselves or simply to apply it to solve their problems. So we do work for a bunch of big companies, Cisco, Oracle, Microsoft, Disney, etc. Okay, so let's dive in. What is a scheduler? Uh, we'll review this super quickly, and uh, I also want to throw out sometimes that these are loosely referred to as orchestrators because there is some overlap in the things that they do, but scheduler is the, the correct technical term. So a scheduler is a tool for managing a cluster of machines and efficiently running applications on top of them. Um, this has a bunch of implications. For instance, developers don't have to worry about provisioning servers anymore. They just write their application, ask the scheduler for some resources like CPU and memory, and then they turn it on. So this is wonderful from a developer perspective because machine setup is no longer a thing. But it's also wonderful from an operator perspective because it simplifies provisioning and often makes scaling applications a relatively trivial operation. <clears throat> so to give you some perspective on how time-saving this can be, I borrowed a slide from VMware, and this is their four to six, four to six week process for how you go about getting hardware to run that new application that you're really excited about launching. So you start by filing a request, someone orders the hardware, sets it up, builds some VMs, configures them, adds DNS to them, and on and on and on. And I don't know about you guys, but if I had to wait four weeks to launch an application, I would probably have forgotten what we were launching by the time my boxes were online. So with a scheduler in place, this process only really has two steps. You make an API request to deploy your latest code, and then you test your application. All the other pieces have been automated away. And more importantly, they're automated in a standardized way, no matter what business group the application came from. So this is a great opportunity to decrease operational overhead by standardizing on a tool set to do all of the provisioning pieces. So you might say, this seems pretty cool, but what we have pretty much works, so why would we bother with any of this? What makes this interesting right now? And there are a few kind of industry trends driving the adoption of these things. The first is the adoption of microservices. Um, software organizations are, are realizing that they can move faster if their applications are smaller, so they're starting to build microservices. And when your applications are smaller, you tend to have a lot more applications. 
And this preponderance of applications also leads to a preponderance of supporting tools like custom deploy scripts, custom log aggregation, custom monitoring, custom chef or puppet scripts, etc. And all of this customization can be avoided by standardizing on a single scheduler solution. Microservices have also caused containers to become extremely popular quickly because they remove any of the inconsistency in your runtime environment. So there's no more of this. It worked fine on my machine when it doesn't work in production because every deployment is completely self-contained and immutable. Uh, and all of these schedulers have pretty good first-class support for containers. The second reason these are becoming popular is to support hybrid clouds. Uh, and the schedulers provide a nice abstraction layer from vendors. So they don't really care where they're running. So if you choose an open source scheduler as your deployment target, then you can avoid vendor lock-in for any specific cloud, cloud ecosystem. It also lets you easily move your applications from on-premise, your local cloud, to an elastic cloud if you want to. And some of, the, some of the schedulers even support deploying applications across data centers or availability zones. There are a couple other use cases to think about. Uh, and these are that uh, some schedulers support uh, natively uh, scalable data stores or highly parallelizable compute frameworks. So if you have a specialized use case like that, schedulers can provide a way to spin these clusters up and down dynamically when you need them. Uh, and then the last obvious reason to look into schedulers is to get optimal utilization out of your hardware. Um, since it's literally scheduling your compute resources, <clears throat> you can run a lot of stuff on a single box while maintaining guaranteed access to certain resources. Um, and at this point, certain resources means CPU and memory. None of the schedulers have good support for reserving disk and network I.O. as of yet. So now that we know why we're adopting these things, we can finally introduce the major players in the scheduler wars. Uh, Mesos is an open source Apache product. Uh, it's built and maintained by a company called Mesosphere, based in San Francisco. Kubernetes is a project out of Google, and it's based on their internal platform that they use to do this stuff called Borg. Nomad is another is built by another SF startup called Hashcorp, and they build some of the best DevOps tooling around, uh, but it's a very young company. And then Cloud Foundry is the oldest solution in the game, and it's primarily maintained by Pivotal, IBM, HP, uh, the big guys. And then lastly, Docker Swarm is a new release on the market, and it tries to make it super easy to get started with this stuff. <clears throat> so despite all being schedulers, these solutions differ in a lot of important ways. Uh, and depending on when they were built, they adopted different sophistications of scheduling strategies. Uh, so the monolithic strategy has a single point of coordination that knows the full state of the entire cluster and do, therefore can do intelligent allocations based on that knowledge. Uh, but it's typically used for pretty static systems, things like Hadoop Yarn that uh, basically allow you to run stuff like Hadoop and Spark on the same hardware. So there aren't a lot of moving parts in systems like this, and it's not very scalable. Then two-level schedulers are a little more free-for-all. There's a central authority that offers resources to each of the frameworks running on it. And those frameworks accept the resources that they need uh, to do whatever it is that is their job. So uh, for example, if we're using Mesos as a scheduler, then as a consumer <clears throat> deploying applications on it, we'd actually talk to a framework like Marathon, uh, which is purpose-built to keep long-running applications online. So Mesos ships with, with Marathon and a few other frameworks that are pretty handy to operate in this two-level scheduling system. And lastly, there are the shared state schedulers. And these guys start containers the fastest because they are optimistically concurrent. So Nomad actually has a benchmark where they start a million containers on 5,000 nodes in less than five minutes, which is pretty amazing. 
Uh, but truthfully, unless you're doing something super specialized or kind of crazy, the scheduling strategies don't matter that much. Most people that consume these things are just more concerned with the features. <clears throat> so since these are all deciding factors, uh, we're gonna dive into this feature differential. It's pretty dense, but bear with me. Um, enterprise support is generally pretty available. The minor caveat is Kubernetes. Google only has plans to monetize Kubernetes through their own cloud offerings. Uh, but So if you want to deploy it on-premise, they don't want to help you with that, but there are some third parties that will provide you support. Then uh, multi-data center support is either unavailable or a pretty new concept for all of these schedulers except for Cloud Foundry and Nomad, and they both ship with, with native support. Um, then we've got virtual networking, which is only supported by Docker and Cloud Foundry. The other solutions rely on integrations with other tools that you have to set up yourself, like Calico and Weave. Then most of these schedulers can be deployed on bare metal, which is a great opportunity to save some money on those hypervisor licenses. Uh, and it's supported by everyone except Cloud Foundry. And some applications require volume mounts for persisting data across application deployments, which can be important depending on how you plan to use your scheduler. Uh, it's not supported in Nomad or Docker, and it has some experimental support in Cloud Foundry, but Mesos is really the market leader here, and this has been a key differentiator for them. So we'll dive into that a bit more later. And then lastly, secrets management is a big piece of configuration and orchestration that doesn't just go away when you start using a scheduler. So Docker and Mesos um, don't have built-in solutions here yet, but everybody else does at this point. So there are some other things you might care about too. Um, if you're only running Java apps, for instance, then maybe you don't really need a container solution. You're already shipping a virtual machine somewhere uh, to run your application. And Kubernetes and Docker both exclusively use Docker containers, so that, that might be a piece of operational overhead that you'd just rather not deal with. Uh, and then most companies don't want to expose their application deployment artifacts to the world, and all the schedulers accept Cloud Foundry support fetching Docker images from an authenticated repository. Then Nomad features built-in support for periodic, periodic jobs, but most of the other ones, you'd have to deploy something like Kronos to run periodic jobs in a highly available way. And lastly, <coughs> IP per container. People can get pretty religious about this one. Uh, it's only really supported by Mesos and Kubernetes at this point, but Cloud Foundry is working on it. So those are the major features you'd expect to be built into your scheduler. Sad that we're not quite done yet, because you probably actually want it to do a whole bunch of other stuff for you too. And the batteries for those things aren't always included. Uh, <clears throat> monitoring is one of those things that everybody wants, but none of these guys will help you with. Uh, except for Kubernetes, they at least have an experimental add-on for slurping up your container statistics and showing them to you. And then, most of these guys feature some very basic streaming log solutions. Typically it's from a single container, but nobody will do log aggregation for you except Cloud Foundry. And then one thing that really has to exist in this kind of operational model is service discovery. So everybody has that box checked. Most of them use a service called Console, which is also built by the guys that make Nomad. Uh, that's used by Cloud Foundry and Docker as well. Then most of the schedulers have a bring your own load balancer policy, which works pretty well, uh, but Mesos and Cloud Foundry will ship with a reverse proxy set up and configured for you. And then the ops guys typically want some kind of auto scaling, so they don't have to wake up in the middle of the night and take action of any kind, so automate as much as possible, right? So Kubernetes is the only one that ships with some simple CPU-based auto-scaling. Uh, nobody else really has that included yet. 
Then we talked about a container registry. Since you have all these deployable artifacts, which is containers or binaries or whatever, you probably want some place to put them. Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry are the only guys that will give you that. Otherwise, you have to set it up yourself. And then for blue-green deploys, you can do this on all the schedulers, but it does take some work. Uh, and Cloud Foundry has kind of the best tooling to make that relatively easy, so I gave them credit for that one. And then despite a few burgeoning tools for container compliance, nobody's including anything like that in any of their schedulers yet. OK, so that was a lot, of, a lot to absorb. Let's just take a minute, take a deep breath. Then we can chat about how people are actually <clears throat> using these things. And there are a couple basic use cases I want to discuss. <clears throat> the first is deploying a 12-factor app. And the second is deploying a managed data service. So use case number one, deploying a 12-factor app. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with this concept of a 12-factor app, it's nothing too fancy. It's a pretty widely accepted uh, set of development best practices to apply to your application. Uh, it's, it's basic things like using a version control tool, uh, scaling using the process model, and then some slightly more controversial things like accepting configuration from the environment. But most of these schedulers are, are built around this kind of mindset. So you can learn more about this at 12factor.net. Anyway, if you structured your application this way, you're in really good shape to get started with a scheduler immediately. Basically, all the schedulers can deploy as many instances of an application like this as you want with a single API call. So now you've got a bunch of instances of your application up and running all over your cluster. Now we need to know where to find them. <clears throat> so this is where the service discovery and load balancing pieces come in. All the schedulers either provide service discovery built in or easily into integrate with a service discovery tool like console uh, is probably the most popular one, like I mentioned. So basically, most of these things are either a central repository that knows where everything is or a daemon that runs on every node and keeps track of what's running on the machine and whether or not it's healthy. Um, console also does some additional things like providing DNS services uh, which is used by some of these, but not super important for, for what we're talking about here. And then load balancing is provided out of the box by Mesos Cloud Foundry, and Kubernetes has some experimental support. So for those guys that don't provide a load balancer for you, modern reverse proxies like Nginx Plus or HAProxy or Fabio, which is a new project out of eBay, that does some pretty advanced things, uh, like canary deploys and things like that. Uh, these guys will all integrate with a service discovery backend to do reverse proxying for you. So now our setup looks kind of like this. We've got a service discovery tool like console running in all the nodes, so we can look up where things are running. <clears throat> uh, we've got a highly available load balancer setup using the service discovery to route traffic to the correct applications. So things are starting to look a little more real now. But uh, before we can ship this all to production, we need to be able to instrument the running application so we can tell what it's doing, and more importantly, what it's doing wrong. So like I said, most of the schedulers provide some way to get application logs from a single instance, but it's usually pretty clunky. Uh, and only Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes provide built-in log aggregation, which makes searching the logs across your instances to find problems way, way easier. And then on the monitoring end of things, Kubernetes is the only one that even tries to support metrics collection with some experimental add-ons, but those are still pretty young too. So the reason this stuff isn't included is that people usually already have some kind of tooling for it, uh, whether they're already running log stash on their nodes and elastic search to make them searchable um, or they're utilizing third-party tools and dumping all their logs to somebody like Splunk. They, people tend to already have something in place for this. So most of the schedulers have not tried to force anything upon you. Um, 
monitoring is in a scalable way yourself is a bit more complicated. Uh, typically involves combining things like collect D and C advisor and then dumping metrics into uh, InfluxDB or Nagios or, or something like that uh, and then making whatever dashboards you need on top of that. So it's pretty common that people have either rolled their own monitoring systems or have again fallen back to third-party tools like New Relic, Datadog, uh, or things like that to track application performance. So assuming we want to do this ourselves, we've added a whole new cluster of services over here uh, to handle aggregation and analytics. I chose to lay out uh, Elasticsearch, Kibana, Influx, and Grafana. And these are all getting data from daemons running on all the hosts, Logstash, and C-Advisor. So at this point, we should be just about ready to go to production. Uh, we just have to worry about these, these last few things. So we still need a place to keep our secrets that's well controlled, ideally audited, and not in our source control repository. So Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, and Nomad provide tools to handle this stuff for you. And then we probably want to put our deployable artifacts somewhere behind the firewall, or at least more secure than a public registry like Docker Hub. So we need some kind of private registry for this stuff. Uh, Kubernetes is the only guy that will ship with something like that. And then optionally, our operators probably want something to automatically scale the application when we need it to. And like I mentioned, Kubernetes has some experimental support for CPU-based auto-scaling. So by the time you're ready to go to production, realistically, you've added like 10 extra things on top of your scheduler. <clears throat> the important thing to remember here, uh, if that seems crazy, is that those extra components are the same across every single one of your applications instead of being duplicated each time you want to deploy a new application. So I realize all that seems like a lot to do, but you don't have to start from nothing. Uh, I want to take a brief aside to talk about a project called Mantle.io, which is basically the system I just described. Uh, it's something we're pretty intimately familiar with because we're currently working with Cisco on productizing it. So they don't have a commercial offering quite yet, but I expect they will in the next six months or so. Uh, and they're effectively looking for private pilot companies, so uh, if you guys are interested in that, definitely let me know afterwards. But uh, the platform piece of this is all open source and provides many of the glue components we talked about uh, for you to provision and run a cluster that does all the stuff for you out of the box. So as you can see in this little diagram, uh, we chose Mesos as the kind of lowest common denominator scheduler because we had some, some data services needs. Uh, but we also have planned support for Kubernetes. So to try it or to find out more, you can check it out at mantle.io. <clears throat> um, so that was a lot of stuff, and all of that was just there to support the simple 12-factor application case. The second use case throws another tiny wrench into things. Uh, and this use case involves deploying clustered applications that need access to storage. And the only scheduler that does that, that really does this well, uh, I mentioned earlier, is Mesos. And this is a hard problem because applications are supposed to be ephemeral. They can run on any node, anywhere, scale up and scale down as much as you want, and even fail regularly. And the system's all just supposed to keep working. Uh, and those things are difficult because your application's data doesn't move when your application does. So most shared file system solutions are either really slow or not highly available. So they're not a good fit for many use cases. Um, it's also worth noting that Kubernetes, in their latest release, <clears throat> just added some experimental support for persistent storage. But it's not quite as sophisticated as what Mesos offers quite yet. So part of why Mesos is good at this is because they provide tools to allow you, as, as a consumer of the framework, to define what happens when nodes in your application fail. Uh, it allows you to reschedule them somewhere else, restore them from backups, or do whatever it is you need to do to get back online. 
So these tend to be very effective for services that are already clustered and manage their own replication. Uh, so like Cassandra and Kafka are good examples of services that thrive in this kind of environment. Uh, and typically, these, when you build one of these frameworks, they add some helpful APIs to handle maintenance tasks for dealing with the cluster. Um, things like scaling the cluster up and down, doing rolling restarts, running backups, etc. <clears throat> so these things are pretty handy, and Mesosphere has built a lot of them for highly available storage, processing, and messaging solutions. Uh, this is just a small small sampling of the available frameworks. Um, they even expose an API for you to make your own if they don't have one for your tool of choice. Uh, for example, Mustwin is currently writing one for InfluxDB with cluster support. So if you want to hear more about what's involved there, I'm happy to dive into that further too. So now we're to the real question. How do you choose whose side you're on? Uh, and at this point, it, it really depends on your use case and your requirements. Uh, I've tried to give you a pretty good cross-section of what all these different schedulers can do, but at the end of the day, it comes down to exactly what you need. Uh, if you're only deploying 12-factor apps, maybe something like Kubernetes or, or Nomad will, will meet your needs just fine. Uh, if everything is going to be in a container, uh, Kubernetes, Docker, most of these guys can, can work just fine with you, but if you don't want to use Docker for whatever reason, it disqualifies some of these. And then if you're going to need data services is, is the last big question, uh, and, and Mesos is definitely a leader in that area. Then compliance is another big deciding factor. Uh, only Cloud Foundry really provides user permission and auditability, so if you want to do change management things and keep track of who's doing what, they're the only guys that, that have that built in already. And then when evaluating the adoption of a new technology, I think momentum is also a hugely important factor. If you want to know that these tools will be around and supportable for the foreseeable future. And all I can say is that all of these solutions are growing really quickly, but the newer ones are definitely smaller, so there's not a clear winner here yet. So maturity-wise, Cloud Foundry has been around the longest. They've solved some of the big company organizational problems like networking, network policy, um, user accounts, auditability, and the newer guys just haven't prioritized those things. Uh, then Mesos and Kubernetes are using newer technologies, so they schedule things faster. Um, Mesos also has the storage stuff pretty nailed down. Then Nomad is relatively new, and that makes it pretty feature immature. Uh, but it's also the simplest to deploy and operate. It's a single binary that runs on all your nodes. So it may be a good fit for really straightforward use cases. Um, but at the end of the day, there's a lot to weigh, and it really depends on your use cases. It's pretty clear these things are the future. Containers are the new virtual machine, and schedulers are the new host operating system but there isn't a clear winner in the scheduler wars yet. So just a quick plug, this is me. We are must win. Uh, we love working on this stuff. You can find me online, so definitely reach out if you have any questions or need any help from us. Uh, I'm gonna try and figure out how to unmute everybody and take some questions. Okay, Carmen's going to answer any questions. I cannot hear you. Let me say something again, Carmen. I think I just unmuted you. Yeah, no luck so far. 
Uh, you can hear us now? Hello? <laughs> Hello? Is there anything on the wall over there? Huh. Brandon tells me you guys are talking, but I can't hear you. Sorry, maybe maybe type the question. I am getting those. Ouch. <laughs> All right, we'll type it. Did you want to ask about Swarm? Are you plugged um, in? I'm not plugged in. I can get plugged in. He was wondering why Swarm wasn't on the last slide. Pretty slide. What? Where are you going? Any thoughts on Swarm is the question. Yeah, I have lots of thoughts on Swarm. <clears throat> uh, it is very new, and their scheduling technology is, is rudimentary at best. Uh, I was joking the other day with a colleague that it is the MongoDB of schedulers. It is super easy to get started, but it doesn't do the job very well. So it, it works fine for simple applications, but uh, Anything, anything real at scale with hundreds or thousands of containers, Swarm is going to fall over on you. And part of that is just because it's new. I'm sure they'll work work on that. Uh, you know, Docker is is in a monetization mode, and they're hugely popular. The technology is hugely popular, but uh, they haven't figured out how to make money on it yet. And I'm sure Swarm is the step in that direction. So. I'm sure that will change, but for right now, it's pretty immature. Uh, a prevalent or 12 factor apps in larger enterprises. Uh, well, I think the companies that are trying to undergo this, this adoption of microservices are also trying to build apps in this way. And part of it is because it makes them easy to inject uh, configuration in an environment and all this stuff using tools like schedulers. So it's growing, but you know most legacy applications are not built in the twelve-factor way. I think that's that's fair. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay, great. Thoughts on OpenShift. <clears throat> uh, so I, ha I don't have personal experience with OpenShift. I think it is a slightly different level of abstraction. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not super confident in answering this because I haven't used it. But from what I know of it, it's uh, more of a like on-premise cloud kind of tool. So you provision machines and kind of kind of the same way. Oh, I just looked it up. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a ton of experience with it. Yeah, regulatory compliance stuff is, is interesting in the space and it's pretty immature uh, across the board. There are some tools for, for doing uh, like security compliance and things like that 
for containers. Uh, and some of the scheduler solutions like Cloud Foundry will let you do network isolation and things like that that are all things that you want in any kind of multi-tenant environment. Um, so a lot of the same kind of tools are there to support uh, any kind of like compliance isolation requirements. But you have to apply them all yourself at this point. You don't get a lot of help from, from schedulers. What are we looking for to participate in the mantle pilot? So um, there's actually two components to this. One is is mantle, and that's kind of what we described. Uh, and then we're also involved with an application that we're building on the top of it to handle the kind of uh, development process. So people create developers create projects uh, and then make commits to a GitHub repository like they normally do, uh, and then does the continuous integration and continuous deployment pieces of it. So we, we build your application, push your container to a registry, uh, and then let you kind of push button deploy to a mantle cluster. So uh, interest in one or both of those things uh, would be awesome. And I think we're just trying to find people that are interested in experimenting with these technologies and seeing if they want to adopt them for their own kind of internal development needs. Uh, if you're interested in it, shoot me a note and I will set you up with the, the product manager over at Cisco who we're working with. Okay guys, thanks a lot for your time. I uh, hope it was helpful and We'll be in touch.